Hello, and welcome to Frightening Fridays, Episode 2. I am Anonymous Neko, and I'm here with my co-host, Bunny. Hi. Just hi? Hi. Well, you, you like, put on all the, you know, rat, razzle-dazzle, and I'm just, like, sitting here. Hi, I'm Bunny. Well, I mean, <laughs> you're allowed to add flair. My flair is my name is Bunny. I like horror movies. It makes me feel better about the world that I live in. If there's like, you know, no zombies or, you know, devilish possessed creatures running around, it makes my 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 horrific world a little less horrific. So, hi. All right. Okay. Well, welcome to our little podcast where we talk about horror, horror comics, horror magazines, horror movies, that anything horror that interests us really. Maybe even some books sometimes. And hopefully this episode will sound better. Uh, what we didn't know when recording last time was my little microphone was dying. So, yeah, hopefully this one sounds way better. But let's get into it. As this is, you know, our second episode, it's a good time to continue with um, uh, introductory, get to know us y, topics y, thingsies. So, Bunny, co-host of Frightening Fridays, what is your favorite horror comic of all time? Of all time? All time. Well, I had been giving that a lot of thought. So, uh, I have to say it's probably the Silver Age and also uh, the what was it, an attempted revival uh, back in the 90s was DC's The House of Secrets. Oh, House of Secrets. Okay, all right, okay. Um, Didn't, but, like, Swamp Thing and Constantine come out of that? Like OG? I really don't know, honestly, because I've never studied that part of it, but I, I do know that originally... Um, it had a couple of uh, Doctor Strange style kind of stuff, but not really. I think, oh, what, what was his name? Mark Merlin? Mark Merlin. That, I sort of remember that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, I think he was in it a little bit. I just remember the stories, the one-off stories. Like the, you know, the spook. Well, yeah, no, no. I just looked it up. Swamp Thing was in one of them um, in the in the 70s. I read more of the stuff from uh, the the you know the silver the silver series. But yeah, Swamp Thing came from House of Secrets 19 uh, n number 92 Ju July 1971. You know, I like the original. That was pretty good. Like it wasn't. It was obviously a a, a knockoff of EC, but you know, it had interesting stuff. But what I really actually liked, and it was not very popular, it didn't do very well, and it didn't go very far. Um, it did run for like a 25 issues, but it was uh, the second. Did you ever read the, the revival in the 90s? I read some of it, um, just random issues, you know, that I got from like a dollar bin probably or you know, two or three dollar box. Yeah. So it was a lot different. It was in this series, it was... A new concept so basically like this runaway girl like ends up in this the house of secrets like literally the house of secrets um but in this run it was basically that you did hear horror stories or you know bad stories terrible stories but they were told the the th the theme device or the plot device was that bad souls were dragged to the house of secrets and they were made to relive their horrible things. And then these ghosts called the juries with an I, G-A-U-R-I-S, judged them. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, and it, they would either, like, be condemned to the basement or allowed to continue on. Um, and then the runaway girl, her whole part of it was she was a witness, kind of like the human element to weigh their decisions, kind of, sort of. Mm -hmm. So... I really, it, it was, it, it wasn't that it was like such a groundbreaking, you know, idea, but just the way it was drawn and the stories and the, um, just the way it was, you know, 
presented. It was just really unique. Something, it it, it was really an indie comic, but it was being produced by Vertigo, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that one. Okay. All right. But, uh, yeah, I, I also looked it up. Apparently, when you were looking it up, I was like, I know one of those DC weird, you know, like dark Justice League people came from House of Secrets. And yeah, I found the Swamp Thing first appearance, too. That little bastard's going for $3,000 <laughs> if you have the first appearance of Swamp Things in House of Secrets. But I have one question for you, Bunny. Sure. Is the House of Secrets as cool as the house from Homesick Pilots? I think I think the House of Secrets from DC Universe is a lot more I almost want to say Grecian or Roman Romanesque. You know that whole thing about, you know, right and wrong and and weighing the scales almost like, you know, in the Egyptian afterworld when you die, you have to have your heart weighed. Mhm. Mm and if it's lighter than a feather, then you can go to one of the mini 16 gates like you can go wherever you want or if you're the bad person, you know, you got to go. I I appreciate how you know a homesick pilots a lot, but it's just more representative of what reality is versus what the House of Secrets represents. Like you know, in a world where the good are you know the good win, the bad are punished. Much where the homesick pilots is about survival of the fittest, and it's much more in line with reality. So I can't say that I I do like homesick pilots. I like the honesty in it, but I prefer. The ideal in the DC House of Secrets. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. I mean, it's all subjective. <laughs> it's very subjective. So, uh, all's love and... Oh, wait, no. All's <laughs> fair and love and horror. <laughs> what is your ultimate favorite horror comic? All right. So, my favorite all-time... A horror comic, the one that, you know, I enjoy the most and the one I would probably recommend for people um, is called Witches with a Y, W-Y-T-C-H-E-S. Uh, it is by, uh, ironically, and you'll see why ironically kind of sort of later, by Scott Snyder. Um, it's, I guess, okay, so it's about this family, like, you know, their kid's been having, you know, uh, uh, a rocky time of it. So, you know, they, they move to get a fresh start. And they move out to, you know, Nowhereville, USA. Classic. I mean, if you're in a horror movie, you you have to move to Nowhereville. It's just the rules. I don't make them. I just follow them. Um, but, yeah, you know, they, they move out to... I don't remember the state, but the, the city's called, like, Litchfield. Um... You know, and like I said, they're starting over, but, you know, something evil is, is waiting at the edge of the woods. Um, I won't give too much away, but, like, the, the townsfolk are willing to trade in whatever the witches that live at, you know, the edge of the haunting forest. They're, they're willing to trade, you know, whatever the witches want in order to, you know, you know, live better lives, you know, get better things. So, it. I feel like, you know, if there were, you know, witches that, you know, popped up, you know, maybe <laughs> even on Craigslist, they're like, hey, you know, bring me your most hated neighbor's dog or child or whatever. And, you know, uh, you're going to get that promotion at work, you know, that kind of vibe. And, you know, then it gets to, you know, you were trying to escape one horror, but uh, you're in another horror. And it's like, ah, uh, I feel that. And art's weird, but, like, that good weird. Story's, like, really good, but, like, weird good. And it's just... It's one of those that surprised me when I read it. I was like, oh, this actually is pretty good. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons I did read it. I didn't read it when it was originally, like, um, coming out. Like, in, you know, normal comic form. Mm -hmm. um, but when it was, like, in a trade. Uh, you know, it had a quote by the... I don't want to say illustrious, but... Um, the well-known uh, Stephen King. Um, it had a little quote by him on the front. It's like, it's fabulous. A triumph. Uh, the most terrifying comic you, you've you ever read is what it said, you know, on the front. Um, you know, a couple of quotes and whatnot. And I was like, all right, give it a shot. And, you know, I was there. It was good. I enjoyed it. 
So yeah. You like your your you like your fantasy horror, don't you? I do like my fantasy horror. You know, it was almost something is killing the children, but I don't know. To me, good sto- good horror stories have to come to an end, and something is killing the children. You know, is this? They're building this big world with it. I I do really like it, but you know, at the same time, I. I don't know, it's like, I don't want to judge something, you know, as, like, being up there until, like, they, they're they done. Like, until I've been told the story. And it's like, okay, I enjoyed this. But, yeah. Anyway. But, no, I I, I have seen some stuff on, on witches, and it seems like be right up your alley. I, I, did, I haven't really paid that much attention to it. But, yeah. I, I'll have to give it a try now. It's good. It's not very long either. It's not a long read, but it's a it's a pretty good read. Um, Mimetic was another like fairly high up there contender. Um, did you have any close contenders, Bunny? Um, I I don't think I other than the crow. I think that was, but you know, oh, the crow. Yeah, the crow. Yeah. The original crow series, and just because it's right up my alley, it's just it probably was is what. Uh, really got me into alternative methods of art and way to tell a story because it's not you know it's not super linear it's really it's it's the only way you have to pay attention and I really like the idea of even though yes it's a visual you know medium um, when the creator makes you have to even with no words study a picture or study a, a series of panels to understand what's going on that kind of really like you know how if you're reading something like reading a book or watching a movie and you see something or read something that just really kind of strikes you and you have to pause back so but it's different with reading because you have to re- reread these words and with a movie you have to listen and, and watch the visuals but i've never had that with a comic book where i had to pause and go back because it was so good you know what i mean i get you yeah so that's probably the crow the original series yeah all right okay what was your runner-up? Was it you said it was mimetic, right? Uh, something is killing the children, and mimetic would be my two really close, almost number ones. Yeah, I have to give it to mimetic for giving this really good story and making it really impactful. But it, there are stories that are so good that it just makes me sad, and I can't touch it again because it just hit a nerve, and that makes it great. But not for re you know, not for rereading or, or enjoying, you know. It's yeah. like a dark, dark truth. Oh, uh, you know, once uh like I read Mimetic, I read it like on um uh the Amazon Prime Kindle thingies, it was like free to read on there. Uh and I read it and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is good. Maybe I'll go get a number one and like, you know, frame it or get it graded or something and they're like fifty bucks. I was like, Oh, well, <laughs> I don't want it that bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of those random horror series get real popular, and it's real hard to get the like the first printings of them. But, yeah. Anyway, shall we venture into our topics for this Frightening Friday? We can, but it is another thing I wanted to bring up is, is I got House of Secrets number one at that cute little... Uh, not, it's not, like, cute, but, like, that really nice comic book shop out in Pueblo uh that was a number one and it was only like 10 bucks or was it it was in the three for 10 wasn't it yeah yeah yeah. the newer series House of Secrets yeah the 96 run yeah anyway but yes let's go to our other top peaks all right your topics for today listeners will be you promised me darkness spiral and the Conjuring, the Lovers. All right, let's get started. First up, we have a new horror comic book, a black and white horror comic book, no less, called You Promised Me Darkness. Uh, all right, so this is uh, more indie than the ones we've previously talked about. This one is from Behemoth Comics. Um, and so... Only issue one's out, or I'm sorry, two issues are out right now. The third one, like, comes out this week, or maybe when you hear this, last week, because we record the week before. 
Um, but anyway, so only a few issues were out, so I couldn't even spoil the end of it if I wanted to. But only going to talk about issue one. So, in You Promised Me Darkness, um, we're met with a... It's kind of hard to say where you, you start with this. So, there's a group of people who get special powers when uh, Haley's Comet, um, you know, comes by Earth. Um, everybody, you know, well, not everybody, but some of these people get, like, some special powers and stuff. Um, and, you know, all their powers are different, unique. Some people, it, you know, turns them, you know, different colors or into weird monsters, you know, um, just different things. But the two primary characters that were first introduced to, um, one of them can just set things on fire, you know, like look at them and like, oh man, I want that to burn. And so, you know, they can burn stuff. And one of them, I guess, can sort of keep someone in like this darkness, dreamy something. Um, I don't think her power is really spelled out up at the beginning, but that may be, you know, purposeful. That way it can be used later. Um, and our, our narrator, our very odd, maybe unreliable narrator, uh, they are this, um, uh, the comet turned them green, and they have to tell you that they were turned green, because apparently they're aware that the comet's in black and white, um, and I guess they have a little bit of, like, a, an Abe Sapien look from Hellboy, um, you know, they're part of, you know, like, the last time the comet came through and not the most recent time it came through. Um, and they, like, have this group and, you know, they try and do good stuff for the world. You know, and, and just be decent people with powers kind of a thing. Not like a Justice League or anything. Uh, more like, um, you know what it reminded me of? Um, what? It, it sort of felt like um, a cross between two things. Uh, so that Russian horror supernatural thriller action movie have not that much action in it but it's pretty good um night watch um and the yeah. sequel day watch um yeah. i got a little bit of that vibe and i got a little bit of like the brpd uh from hellboy um the the paranormal research i've already forgot what the acronym stands for in hellboy <laughs> but you know that group of you know like misfits and people with superpowers and you know oddities and whatnot it, it felt like a cross between those two for me yeah i i agree it is it's very meta it is very meta so that it doesn't seem to take itself too seriously and i think that's the point because it's really dark like the subject matter is super dark uh because and it's it's i don't i don't know if the boy has or the the the, the brother Oh, by the way, they are not, like, blood-related. These are, like, foster brother and foster sister. Um, just so we put that out there. Uh, it's, uh, basically what I understood his power was is that he's haunted by this firepower called the Boogeyman. And he needs to be in darkness, you know, so that... Something to that effect was that his sister promised him darkness. That's where the title comes from, so that he could be free of the the fiery power that kills everybody because from what I read or what I remember in the very beginning of the story so it's not giving anything away is that he came to be in this foster home for the children of the comet that's what they called him um, because he ended up burning a, his whole family alive with this power he calls it the boogeyman is what it is it's not the boogeyman it's his power um, but I think with the sister just to clarify is is that she has a what I remember them describing was that she had the power to bring someone's nightmare to life. So whatever terrifies this person or whatever scares the person, she's able to bring it into reality. It's something from what I understood. So they're, they super don't sound like nice people, but yet they're running away from uh, this villain who want, I'm not going to give too much away, but basically he wants to end them. And uh, so they're running for their lives in this dark landscape and it is in black and white but i i really appreciate the fact that they like i mentioned that they do have that uh narrator even if it's unreliable his name is sage um because you get a glimpse he's able to you know give you a glimpse into the world 
and give you a glimpse into this dark stuff going on and it doesn't feel so you know stark does that make sense yes because he does have a or sage i don't know what their gender is i don't think they say uh but sage is a laugh right i enjoy it sage is pretty funny um uh, I believe the antagonist name is the anti everything. Like they can, like take other people's powers ish Highlander style maybe. It's roguish. Roguish, yeah, I but, guess. But a lot darker. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot darker, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, w I want to talk a little more about the book. Um, so like, I didn't like. Well, I don't want to say I didn't like, but I wasn't necessarily enjoying the book uh, for, like, the first half. Because, you know, unreliable narrators drive me insane sometimes. But, like, when the, the brother and sister are in, like, the uh, industrial building, warehouse, whatever thing. And, you know, outside they see all these zombies. Lawyer zombies. <laughs> 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 Zombie lawyers uh, coming after them. And they're like, oh, oh gosh, and, you know, whatnot. And they're like, ah, oh, well, maybe, you know, we ought to get out of here uh, after some discussion. Because, um, you know, he wants to, like, burn them and stuff. And she's like, nah, it's burning stuff's not always the answer, bro. You know, stop that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, they, they, they start trying to get away. And, and like, you know, a, a little cat, you know, comes up and it's like, hey, uh, I'm, like, with the good guys and stuff. And, uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, there's this guy after you called the anti-everything. We don't like him either. Hey, but don't worry. My partner's going to take care of your pursuers. And, like, outside there's this awesome, like, girl with, like, spider legs slash tentacles slash floating eyeballs and uh, really cool looking uh, thing and... Like, there's this whole, like, two-page spread um, while the cat's talking to him. He's like, oh, don't worry. She'll probably done, be done with them real quick. And, you know, flashed outside. And it's like this giant eyeball on spider legs with little octopus tentacles waving and flapping below it. And, like, all the, you know, dead <laughs> zombie lawyers are just strewn about this um, parking lot-ish thing. Uh, and I was like, okay, all right, I'm 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 here you know, crazy, super-powered weirdos out in the world trying to do good stuff. All right, I'm, I'm here. And that, that's kind of where I draw the, the Night Watch slash BRPD um, um, parallels, I guess. Um, but yeah. I know why you didn't like the first half of the book. Why? It's not just unreliable, relate, uh, blah, blah. unreliable narrator. It is because they used... A lot of flashbacks and flash forwards and meta little info bubbles and I enjoyed it because like again I already mentioned it, I don't really mind you know experiment uh, you know ex experimentation and narration like it doesn't always have to be linear and I'm okay with that as long as it like you said before serves a purpose and it does but I find for you you are a very <laughs> but you're a very creature of habit you want the story given to you no matter how it's told, you want it in a certain order pattern that makes sense to you. Like, if it's going to be in the past, let's go through the past first, then let's jump to the present. Not let's hip hop back and forth. That's why you didn't like it, I think. Well, that's not 100% true. Because, like, my favorite movie of all time is the most disjointing for most people. Cloud Atlas is not told in any linear. <laughs> Man, that's not true. It is very linear, just because there's six or seven different plot lines going on at the same time. That's true. All the plot lines move individually forward. That's true. You're right. You're right. There's still a there's still linear, you know, linear storytelling. It's just they're told consecutively, and that's what's disjointing to people. Um, your attention span is very good, if you know, but I, I do think you. It's almost. Zenish. That's what I wanted to say before, and I couldn't really think of the word. The way it, the the art, and the the way the story is delivered, and the you know very, I don't almost want to say it, but almost like punkish, you know, 
uh, flavor to the whole thing. Don't you get that? Yeah. Like a very subversive, you know, anarchy in the, in the <laughs> UK kind of feel. I, and I love that. I mean, I grew up reading the, you know, zines and stuff that I would find on college campuses and whatnot. So I really dig that because for me, it's like kind of like a, um, I don't, I don't, I do have this ideal world of where like good is good, bad is bad and you know, whatever. But if it's not going to be that way, I want it to be as creative and as, I think why a lot of people don't like the, uh, and maybe you don't for the same reason is because you're the one who has to decide, you know, your moral footing in this story. Do you agree with the villain? Do you agree with the good guys? Do you think they're both fucked? <laughs> um, I think when stories are told kind of in this subversive way, you're not given all the pieces you need to know. You're given like, you know, it's almost very cerebral. That's what it is. It's very cerebral. It's very um, cold in your own mind. You're given the pieces of the story, but you have to kind of put them together yourself. And in and, and, and that way, I like that creativity. I like that freedom. I'll shut up now. No, you're fine. I get you. And yeah, I do get the whole anarchy thing. Like when we, you know, do get to actually, you know, spend a, a few pages with our, you know, bad guy. We find out the bad guy might not be the bad guy. Um, there's also, well, I mean, he may very well be the bad guy. I don't know. But, and we're only talking issue one, so no spoilers for two, three, and so on. Um, it's only like a five or six issue series. But anyway, the, you know, there's like a girl that's maybe controlling him. And she looks straight up like she's, you know, out of the 80s. You know, got those super round sunglasses. I don't know if it was in color. I imagine them with like purple tinted, you know, <laughs> lenses. Um, but yeah, like maybe with a British accent, I feel maybe, you know, I get that vibe. Can I talk about what I feel is like a, a rampant theme that I didn't really notice until I started thinking about it and talking about with it, mm -hmm. talking about it with you now. So like you mentioned, like we don't even know if the person who is portrayed or framed as the villain, you know, the anti everything, if he's actually the one pulling the strings. So when I thought about that, then I thought about, you know, we're looking at the, you know, the foster brother and sister, the one, they both have very powerful um have power i'm sorry i was going to say powerful powers they have super super charged power powers and they can do a lot of damage and given anything else you feel like even in the first few pages or th when we get introduced to them the brother is like let's burn everything ah! and you go and the sister's like no let's not do that let's let's do good let's do the thing we need to do and even with our narrator sage um we haven't brought this up yet but he's talking about his friend who's also uh, appears to be immortal because like um say, if you remember sage talks about all the powers like they've developed over the years and we've come to find out like he was like sage was born right in like 1910 when the you know the haley's comet passed through and has been alive since then and just acquiring powers. But Sage does not, Sage does not say how Sage gets these powers. Do you remember that? Oh, that's true. Sage so just says he gets powers, you know, like what, every 10 years? I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, it gets new powers. Cause like teleportation is the new cool one or something like that, yeah. So we haven't been introduced to how Sage has obtained these additional powers. We have learned how the anti everything does and that's a special form that we're not going to talk about because that's kind of a spoiler but also if these the ones that are immortal the ones that live a long time like sage and his friend he talks about this very you know regal you know walking around and negligee floating negligees uh just oozing the the sex and it almost feels like sage is in that relationship that the, the fiery powered brother is with his foster sister and what it appears to be with anti everything and this you know undisclosed woman telling him possibly pulling strings it feels like almost in every stance that this story is that someone is being controlled by someone else and it appears to be they're all controlled by women I don't um, know I, I, all right. I, I saw that kind of strange 
all, parallel. Yeah, all three of the groups of individuals do seem to have a, a female handler, maybe, is the good word. Something like that, but, I mean, I just found that, that common thread. It's kind of like, but I, I don't think it's meant to be blatant or even be that important to the story. It, it's almost like, you know, the people with the power, you think they're the ones with the power, but truly it's not it's more someone behind the scenes control so for the fiery brother you know and his sister it is not it doesn't seem to be have any malice intent like she's trying to help him not be become a murderer you know like trying to get him to be good so in that way that's a positive influence i'm not really sure who sage's you know floating negligee woman is mm -hmm. to sage and what kind of power they she exerts over sage but there is that power dynamic where she's in charge. And then we go over to the anti-everything that we've seen only briefly and heard about from Sage. But the first time we do see the anti-everything, it's being framed where he, he seems to be being, I don't want to say prompted, uh, encouraged or counterpoint, the anti-everything can control the zombie lawyers. It's kind of weird. So there's like this definite rep repetitive theme of being controlled by somebody else or being influenced influenced but i'll stop now there's a pyramid of power among the comet people we we are all who you think is in control is not always the person who's in control hmm. fair enough okay. all right shall we move on to our next topic sure all right our movie for today's episode is going to be spiral not the Spiral, the Book of Saw Spiral, but Spiral. Uh, the movie that if you watch the trailer, it looks like some, you know, uh, creepy cult witches are trying to kill a gay couple and their daughter. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty much what it is, but it's a lot more than that. I Go ahead. I you introduce this one. Go for it. Oh, okay. So Spiral is actually, from what I could review or pull uh, pull from is a it's actually a 2019 Canadian horror film uh, so I, I did notice some Canadian A's in there but I didn't want to assume uh, but basically it's kind of a typical horror thing that's very prevalent you've seen a million times um, new family moves into home uh, either home or neighborhood is kind of fucked up in some way and they have to uh you know they're trying you know trying to survive the horror that is all around them or trying to find out what you know what is the horror um and i did like it i i really really enjoyed the message and the story it presented i'm sometimes a little bit uh I, I sometimes got lost in what in in the in this story that as it was being presented to us because I felt like it it really relied on a lot of what we were already talking about the unreliable narrator to keep you guessing which is fine and I still enjoyed it it's just that I think it kind of got stuck on that and that became the major plot device and I wish they would have concentrated harder just a smidge and harder on the characters and character uh, development. But basically, the uh, gay family moves in to a suburban home. Um, technically, they say they move from Chicago to the small suburb. And uh, Aaron is the, you know, corporate white guy type, you know, going to work for the family, earning the dough. Malik is a former, what they said, party monster, which was a nod to, of course, you know, the party scene, the party kids um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And Malik was one of them, and now he's a writer. And uh, so you think it's like them moving. You think that everybody's on board with moving to the suburbs, but you find very quickly, uh, one, the only person who's super happy about being there in the first place is Aaron because he wanted the peace and quiet. Malik is reluctant, reluctant to, to warm up to people around him. Um, he's suspicious of his super straight white neighbors staring at him all the time. And... You know, through a series of flashbacks, you're introduced that uh, when Malik was a teenager and ha I guess it was his very first boyfriend, 
um, they were gay bashed. Um, they were making out in a car and a uh, bunch of road dudes found them and, and attacked them. So you get a very big sense that uh, Malik has gone through trauma. He's very mistrustful already. He's suspicious. And so anything that happens is painted, you know, seen through that light, through Malik's point of view. We don't get to see Aaron's point of view very much at all, do we, though? We, we don't. But I think that's very much intentional. Yeah. To uh, get that unreliable narrator. Yeah, but... So... I I also really liked the movie. Um <laughs> but this is another one where part of the way through I was like, "Ugh, I don't, I don't you know, this is just you know, you it's hard to say without spoiling it for you, but there are many you're going to think you know what's going on and you might but then it might be something else and it might be that but that might also be the thing you thought was going on and not the other thing you thought was going on but it might also all be this other thing and they they said on malik um and, and if you're like us when you watch you know horror movies that have like a you know like something's going on the neighbors are weird you know whatnot it's um you're sitting there trying to figure it out you know I guess halfway through, I decided that, oh, I figured this out, you know, so, you know, it's just sort of boring getting to the end. But when he got to the end, it was like, oh, oh, five minutes later, it was like, oh, no. And I think that's part part of why I did enjoy it. They never gave you enough information one way or the other so that you could. There was just I felt like the movie. We talked about this before, not on this podcast, but like in in our general movie conversations where we know that this movie idea was great that they that they executed it perfectly within whatever budget or time they had but it suffered from not being able to be expanded upon because probably lack of budget i did look it up apparently it was filmed in 21 days on a really low budget so it was probably could have been improved upon but there were they never gave you enough information, and I think that was important so that it kept you guessing. The second part is also, though, that the fact that they didn't have the time or the ability to do so, they didn't really expand upon certain things touched on in the film. Like, like there was one scene with the kid, um, not, not the kid, if you know what I mean, but the, one of the kids in the neighborhood after... Uh, coming to visit Malik about something bad that happened to to him in his life. You you see him out in the middle of the woods just like freaking the fuck out. But then you never see him again. You never hear anything more about it. And it's just like, what the fuck was that? You know, what? Like, I know it was put in as an additional way to keep, you know, throw you off to hype the tension. But it felt like some things they brought up were, that could have been really important or really significant or poignant in the story. And I wish they would have expanded upon it, but they didn't. So this is a very, I think it just suffers from the fact that it didn't have the ability to, it has so many good points, but I don't think they had the ability to weave a better story with them. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I I think they did fine. I mean, you could tell it was lower budget, but I mean, that's fine. I, I like low budget horror flicks. Those are sometimes the more inventive and fun ones. Um, but yeah, you know what? It kind of reminded me of, like, a little, like, not a lot. Um, one of the the worst uh, Saw movies, um, <laughs> we're talking about Spiral, but not Spiral, the book of Saw, but anyway, um, uh, Jigsaw, like the last one before the most recent one, mm -hmm. um, where, it, like, the whole story just, it, it all seems rushed, nothing is making a lot of sense, and it's just like, oh, what am I even looking at? And you're like, okay, so, you know, the girl's a creepy, you know, saw fan and she's reproducing, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, whatever, this is the bad guy. Can we just get to the end? But then you get to the end and it's like, oh, I was so distracted with, you know, I guess b both Jigsaw and this movie Spiral. Part of the way through, I felt, oh, I figured this out. I'm... I'm I'm a little bored. I wish they'd get to the end. 
and in both instances we got to the end and it was like oh oh you know I, I had that you know thing and it's like well I'm the dummy who quit paying attention to the clues that were being left because I thought I'd you know solidified in my mind what was going on and I just sort of stopped <laughs> and that's kind of the genius of it so you you're like I don't think you actually don't I I don't think we actually dislike the movie in any way or have any negativity in it. It's more like they purposely did that shit to throw us the fuck off. And then when we figure it out, we're like, God damn it. We're mad at ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, this wasn't a bad movie. I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you gave up on the movie. You, you sh like, So if you stick with it, 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 it's and it's not a movie that's hard to stick with because you I mean, there are movies when you start watching them, you're just like, okay, I know what they're trying to do, and I really do appreciate it, but it's not paying off in the way I wanted it. It's not going to pay off because they're, I know exactly where this is headed, and the payoff is low. The payoff here is great. The, the buildup is great. You just, I just think in our consumption of media, we want everybody to do an M. Night Shyamalan, you know, twist, and I don't think that you should, and I don't necessarily think that's great. It's just that this movie throws you off for the entirety of it and then when you get to the end you're just like oh but what I really think is is, is something that a lot of movies don't capture is the fear element like I didn't know what was going on I didn't know who to trust and I really didn't appreciate you know being made to have these like super like doubts about my own understanding of the story because I was like what the fuck what's going on so in that way, I think it's successful. I don't think someone who doesn't like super psychological fear, thrill type deals will enjoy it. But if they just give it a chance and stick through it to the end, yeah, it, it, there's a good payoff. Totes. I agree. Also, well, no, I can't say that. I was going <laughs> to no, I won't say it. Um, totally different. Yeah. Well, my apologies. But anyway, I felt, you know, it was very yeah. parallel to, you know, you know, utter devastation of a gay person where it isn't a fault. No, I can't say that either. Shit. You can't say that out. either. Yeah. No. Okay. Just final, know, audience at thoughts. home, audience at home, we have had to cut out a chunk because we want you to enjoy the movie. So we do have some spoilers, obviously, but we don't want to murder the crux of the movie for you. So yes, final thoughts, Bunny. Final thoughts. Well worth the watch stay with it it pays off and it's a really good film that features an lgbtq couple and family and i thought that was great yes i give this a solid seven out of ten is what i would give it i would give i'd give this an eight for story um yep uh eight i really enjoyed it okay all right well are you ready to move on to our final topic sure all right so as you may know, uh, there is a new Conjuring movie out and about in theaters and HBO. Yeah, and they have a horror comic book that is a prequel to the movie, um, which... The Conjuring, uh, uh, semicolon, The Lover. Yes. I thought it was Lover. It's not Lover. Is it Lovers? No, oh, it's The Lover. Oh, it is The Lover. Oh, I was... <laughs> You know, I've been saying The Conjuring, The Lovers, in my head this whole time. All right, you're right. It is The Lover. But this is a prequel uh, to the movie. And shame on them. But, you know, you can't really blame them. You know, pandemic, whatnot, for not timing this better. I would have rather, like, it's a four-issue series, but, like, only one or two issues is out right now. Um, we're only going to talk about the first issue. But, yeah, it's like, why couldn't I have read this whole story before I, you know, venture out and watch the new Conjuring movie, The Devil Made Me Do It, I believe is the title. But yeah, so let's talk The Conjuring, The Lover. And this is from uh, DC Horror, DC's new horror imprint. Um, art's got a, uh, I don't know, it's like an 80s mixed with a modern vibe for the uh, the, the artwork and stuff. Um but, you know, straight off the bat, you know, again, we're only talking issue one, so we're not going to spoil too much. You know, we see, you know, this this ritual taking place, you know, blood sacrifice, um, goodness going on. And, you know, finally we meet, you know, the main character and, 
you know, she's in college, her mom's come to pick her up. Um, she's, you know, a studious kid. Um, but you know, she kind of got a crush on, you know, this person or that person. And there's this boy who's like, hey, why don't you come hang out with me? And she's like, no, no, no. And the, the girl's remembering like her, you know, her best friend and they got these bracelets together. And uh, then we get into the, the horror elements of, her, of it. Uh, in a library, something is, is the, I guess, the campus library because she's in college uh, or community college. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, she's getting stalked by this presence. And, you know, we get the, the false scare up front of, you know, that, that guy's back to pester her again. And she's like, ah, I need to study. But yeah, and then you get this, I would call it a, a cinematic uh, shot where the lights in the library all start slowly going off behind her. And then you see this creepy pair of eyes and the hand reach around the corner. Um, yeah, so some things after her, you, you don't really know why. Um, there's hints that maybe, you know, our main character girl has a thing for this other girl. Um, but you're just not really given much to go on. But... Uh, there are a few more pages. She's continually stalked by this this red-eyed, dark, creepy-clawed presence thing. Uh, and when she falls asleep, it looks like it's, you know, finally got her. It's a great little panel with, like, negative space use and you know, pretty good. Um, and, it, you know, to be continued, it says. Uh, but then the best part of the comic for me happened. Um, it's not just a uh, conjuring prequel comic it's it's got two stories two horror things to it and i liked <laughs> i liked the second story a lot better because it was it was self-contained you know i got to read a a horror story um about you know a guy and you know paying the the ferryman and i don't want to spoil it but one i was really surprised there were two stories in this this horror movie prequel comic the second story i don't know if it i'm sure it's in the conjuring universe somewhere because you know the annabelle the nun all that's in the the conjuring universe um so i'm sure it's in there somewhere but i think it's just a really good like side story horror wise like i was really like oh okay i'm a big fan of you know getting more stories for my money's worth kind of a thing so mm -hmm. i was I was digging that, you know, there were multiple stories in this. Um, you know, like I said, especially since, you know, you're not going to get to the end of the main story before, if you're, if you're going to the theaters or watching it on HBO, before you watch, you know, the actual movie. So at least I did get one horror story that I had a beginning, middle, and end for. So, yeah, um, I've talked a lot. What did you think, Bunny? Well, I actually really, really, really enjoyed both stories. I think... Uh, the first one is just gonna it's gonna have to cure with you know more time and it was a very it was a very detailed but very brief introduction into the story um, about the main I guess it's the main story with her um, I did uh, I did like the devilish elements and and I love the art I think the art is just so it's so it's almost it reminds me of the 80s like just in tone and uh and color tr palette you know and i really feel it captures that feel for me and it does make me feel like i'm watching an old home movie on betamax you know and uh but i i was a little disappointed because i didn't get as much as i wanted from the story immediately but you're right the second secondary story from the universe of the conjuring i love it was so well just boom 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 and then i was like i wonder who wrote this and i was like da 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 and i was like scott snyder really <laughs> <laughs> i was like that's why i liked it but the art was also really good too yeah i was surprised too when i saw scott snyder was was writing it which he does a ton of dc stuff um yeah he did the whole well not all of it but most of that weird you know DC dark metal oh yeah thing that happened he did a lot of that story which some of it was good um some of it 
was not. But yeah, the the first story, I was just kind of like, I didn't get to know these characters. All I get is this creepy thing, which, like you said, the art was great. Art was good. Um, but there was like, I barely got introduced to these characters. Something creepy's after. What? But where am I going? What am I doing with that? Exactly. You, you want more. But I think that's the whole point. I guess. Um. Yeah. I, don't, I did want more. It was like, ah, just tell me the whole stupid story. Oh, uh, give me, you know, give me a good one shot if you're trying to give me a horror movie, you know, prequel, I guess. Which I'm fine with, you know, um, Especially something that has as big a universe as The Conjuring. Like, it's ten, nine movies deep? I'd have to look it up. But there's a bunch of movies that are within The Conjuring universe. Um, and, I mean, I do like it. And so if you're going to expand on that with, uh, you know, books, comics, whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm down. I'm game. You can bring me along for the ride. But I just I felt a little let down that the main story... That cut off so short. Yeah, it, it was like nothing, but then you know, got down, you know, another page or two, and it was like, oh, I got another tale, and you know, it was it was pretty all right, short, sweet, good. I also really enjoyed those inserts, like the creep, like you know, from the old time, you know, from Silver and Gold Age, where it had like those mail away weird. Oh comments. yeah, like satanic panic stuff that would have you know caused mothers of the day to, you know, be upset. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was a nice touch. I really thought that was a good touch. But, but uh, yeah. so, um, do we have any final thoughts or? Uh, final thoughts. Um, I'd probably wait until this is available as like a trade, because <laughs> um, you're not gonna get much out of issue one, honestly. But I did and really I did really enjoy the I, I do like anthology because I do like those self contained stories because it's like you have to be so creative in the self contained stories to relay the message, relay the theme and uh keep the mood heightened because, you know, you only have such a short story to tell it in. I guess that's why I kinda got mad it's broken up. But then we're going to get those, you know, inserts. We're going to get those, you know, self-contained stories. So I'm not mad at it. But it may be better, better in a trade, like you said. I agree. Yeah, I'd go trade. Art's good. You know, the story's probably going to get better. And if the trade's like, you know, all of the main story and then like four or five little, you know, extra self-contained horror goodness, I think that'd be well worth it at that point. But... I don't know if I'd get any more individual ones, you know. This uh, this one little comic's just going to get stacked in a comic box. <laughs> All right. So before we fi end our podcast, any final words, thoughts? Something. I think I think it's it's that maybe we should give our unreliable narrators a little bit more credit. We probably should give our unreliable narrators a little more credit. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to episode two of Frightening Fridays, the sister podcast to Frightening Frequencies. Please, if you could, like, share, and subscribe to our content. We would appreciate it. If there's something you would like us to uh, take a gander at, please let us know in the comments on our YouTube page uh, under the video. We will read them and definitely consider them. We have a, a huge list of things we want to get through that's, you know, coming out. I want to try, try and stay kind of modern. But other than that, thank you for listening, my little giblins. Ghost, goblins, giblins. I'm going to stick with that. I've decided I like it. Giblins is never going to happen. But yes, please let us know if there's anything you would like us to review or take a look at. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. I hope you have a frightening Friday. A frightening Friday. Bye. Bye.